Good evening students. I hope you all are doing good and I hope your preparation is going fine. Welcome to today's analyst. This is 1st of August 2023 and we are here to discuss important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. Now the handout of the session is there in the description box. You can download it to streamline your current affairs preparation. Now let us see the table of contents and the topics which we are going to discuss today. See, the first very important topic for us is fiscal deficit and what are the various ways to reduce fiscal deficit in our country. Second important topic is the employment picture and the very big issue of unemployment in our country. Third big topic is your unpaid work by women, which is pertaining to your social issues. Fourth topic is related to your space debris. Fifth topic is your Akira ransomware. Now let us start with the first topic. So fiscal deficit has touched recently 25.3% of full year target in April to June months. So in relation to that, let us take a look at the fiscal deficit in totality. What is the concept of fiscal deficit? How fiscal deficit is problematic for our country? And what measures government has taken in order to reduce the fiscal deficit? Now, why it is important for our GS paper 3, Indian economy portion, this fiscal deficit becomes important. Now, the first question which comes to our mind is that what is fiscal deficit? Now, if you have seen the government budget, it is divided into two parts. That is expenditure and revenue expenditure and revenue. So when expenditure done by the government is more than the revenue which government receives, then in that condition, you call that situation as fiscal deficit. Because when expenditure is more and revenue is less, that means you are spending more than what you are getting. In that condition, fiscal deficit comes into place. Now, expenditure is more than the revenue minus the borrowings, which is why fiscal deficit also reflects the level of borrowing which government needs to do. So, if we are spending more than what we are getting, obviously, we need to borrow that money which we are spending more, right? For example, if I am receiving 100 rupees, right? and I am spending 120 rupees, my expenditure is 120. So that 20 rupees which I need to spend more, I need to borrow it from someone. So fiscal deficit in a way indicates the level of borrowings which government needs to make. So fiscal deficit indicates what? It indicates the level of borrowing or debt burden on the government. I hope this is very clear to all of you. Now, many people think that there is only negative aspect of this fiscal deficit. But again, if we realize that what is the real purpose or what is the real aim of the government? Real aim of the government is not to make profits. Rather, the aim of the government is to ensure public welfare. So when government is ensuring public welfare, it needs to be guided by principles of non-profit. Which is why if government is spending more, that means government is spending more on public welfare, right? So there are some positive aspects to fiscal deficit as well. Let us look through some of the positive aspects of fiscal deficit. First is government spending. Now, when government is spending more and more, ultimately government expenditure is a part of our GDP, right? It's a part of our gross domestic product. So when government spending increases, eventually GDP of the whole economy also increases. Because we all know that a government expenditure or the capital expenditure made by the government is having a multiplier effect in the economy. That is one rupee spent by the government in building capital gives return twice, thrice or even four or five times that investment or that money spent by the government. So there is a multiplier effect to government expenditure as well. So that is a positive aspect of fiscal deficit. Then public investments. Now government is spending money on building schools, building roads, building colleges, building hospitals, which are things for public utilities. 
So when government is investing in public utilities, ultimately it is a positive thing only. So that, that is one of the positive aspect of fiscal deficit. Now when government is spending so much money, obviously job creation will also happen because of that multiplier effect. For example, government is building a bridge. So that build construction of the bridge will give employment to a lot many people. So job creation also happens. So in relation to employment generation, the, uh, it is also a positive aspect of fiscal deficit. Now, what are the various negative aspects of fiscal deficit? First is that it increases the debt burden on the government. That is, government is borrowing more and more money to cover this fiscal deficit. It, because of that, it increases the debt burden on the government. So government has to now repay more and more debt which it has taken. And plus the interest payments on that debt are very substantially high. Inflationary pressure, that is the second neg negative aspect. Now when government is spending more and more, eventually what is happening? Money supply in the economy increases. When money supply in the economy increases, that is people are having more money to spend. In that case, inflationary pressure builds in the economy. Now, how inflationary pressure builds? Let's suppose there is a 10 rupees, uh, 10 rupees item, right? And people are having income, right? But the supply of that 10 rupees item is limited. So what people will do when their income increase? Someone will say, okay, I'm ready to pay even 15 rupees for that 10 rupees item because my income is high. Someone will say, I will, I'm ready to pay 16 rupees. So from supply side, when supply is limited, ultimately increase in income of people, make the buying competitive and ultimately leads to a inflationary pressure, right? Crowding out. Now, when government is spending a lot many money in the economy, ultimately in some cases, it leads to crowding out of private investments as well. So private investments in the overall economy gets reduced because of that. That is one negative aspect of a government spending more than it is earning. That is fiscal deficit, not twin deficit problem. Now we are not just having fiscal deficit problem in our country. We are also having current account deficit in our balance of payments. So when fiscal deficit increases, obviously there is some type of impact on the current account deficit as well. Right, And this twin deficit problem, it increases further. And our focus should be to reduce this twin deficit problem rather to fuel it even further. So this twin deficit problem is also a negative aspect of fiscal deficit. Now what are the various steps taken by the government towards fiscal consolidation? That is to consolidate our fiscal policy and in order to reduce our, in order to reduce our expenditure, and increase our revenues, right? So when expenditure gets reduced and revenue gets increased, ultimately the problem of fiscal deficit will be solved. And that is what you call fiscal consolidation. First step in fiscal consolidation is your subsidies rationalization. That is subsidies, a very huge burden on the government exchequer is the subsidies which it has to pay to the people of our country. Various kind of subsidies are there. Uh, Nutrient-based subsidies are there, then farming subsidies in various sectors also, MSME subsidies to MSME sector, LPG subsidy, fuel subsidy. So various kind of subsidies government is providing, right? When we rationalize those subsidies and we provide those service, uh, subsidies in a targeted manner only to those people who really need it, in that case, we will be able to substantially reduce our expenditure. And ultimately, it will lead to fiscal consolidation, debt management. Now, we need to manage our borrowings very, very carefully. We need to look out for avenues which gives us cheaper interest rates. From those sources, we need to borrow. Also, we need to be very, very prudent when we are borrowing, right? So proper debt management needs to be there. Then fiscal prudence. Now, fiscal prudence means what? That whenever government is spending some money, it should not be extravagant. It should only be on the necessity items, only on the welfare of the public. So fiscally, government needs to be prudent if they want to reduce the fiscal deficit. 
Also, this FRBM Act, that is Fiscal Reduction and Management Act, it has also laid down the levels of the fiscal deficit that the government needs to achieve by certain dates. So that target keeps on increasing. Sometimes government amends this act as well. But what is the need of the R is that FRBM Act needs to be more consolidated, needs to be more accurate, and it should be implemented in a better manner. So that government do not amend it time and again and government follows the FRBM Act and does not use the escape clause very much. Because the usage of escape clause has been very very high in this FRBM Act because of which the deadlines shift again and again. Right. So this needs to be implemented properly. Now increasing our tax base. This is also very important. See we have to encourage our population to pay more and more taxes. Do not evade the taxes which they are evading. And how this will be possible? First is that we be sincere, we have to be fiscally prudent and we should be, the government should be sincere in implementing the government policies. Because if public is seeing that okay government is utilizing that money effectively and efficiently, then public will be motivated and be more aware to not evade taxes and increase the tax base in our country. Now if you see the trend in deficit, that is fiscal deficit of our country, you would see from 2021-2022 to 2023-2024 which is the budget estimate, it is hovering close to 6%. Now in 2021-2022, it was 6.7% of the GDP, that is a fiscal deficit. In this 2023-2024, it is estimated that our fiscal deficit will be close to 5.9%. And in the last year, that is 2022-2023, fiscal deficit was close to 6.4% of our GDP. Now ideally, in a very prudent state, in a very prudent country, fiscal deficit should not cross more than 3%. So from that standards, fiscal deficit of our country is very, very high. Now moving on to the second topic of today, it is related to the employment picture of our country. Now I explained pages in there is there in the Indian Express newspaper related to the employment picture and the scenario of employment in our country. Right. Uh, now, in order to understand this employment picture, we need to understand what is the problem of unemployment in our country. Right. And how there is a decrease and decline in the employment levels in our country. OK. Now, why this is important from a GS3 perspective in Indian economy, employment has been very, very specifically mentioned. So we need to cover employment picture in detail. Right. Now, first of all, we need to understand that who all are the unemployed and employed people in our country in order to understand the unemployment and employment scenario and picture. Right. So first of all, uh, any person who is looking actively for work and is willing to work, two conditions, any person who is looking for work and actively willing to work but not getting the work which he or she is looking for and actively willing to work, if he or she is not getting the work, that person will be termed as unemployed. So who all are unemployed? The people who are actively seeking work and who are willing to work but not getting the work. They are unemployed. Right Now those people who are not working, they are not even looking for work. They are not actively uh, like they are not actively willing to work also and they are not looking for work also. They will not be categorized under unemployed. They will not be even the part of the labor force as well. Right. So when we calculate the unemployment rate, we calculate it by having unemployment, um, unemployed people in the numerator and the total labor force in the denominator. And total labor force includes what? The people who are employed and people who are unemployed. Those who are not looking for work, those who are not willing to work as well, they are not a part of labor force in itself. 
I hope you got this concept. Now, what are various kind of unemployments which are existing in our country? See, first unemployment is the disguised unemployment, which is seen in the agriculture sector in our country. Now, let's say there is a field. In that field, agricultural field, agricultural farm, only five people are required to work. If five people work, the agriculture produce will be sufficient, right? But in spite of this five people, 10 people are working in that farm. The extra five people who are working, but they are not needed to work in that place, they are suffering from disguised unemployment. That is, even though they are working, but they are working in that land is not adding some extra value to that production, right? So, those extra five people are termed to be unemployed in a disguised manner. I hope this is clear to all of you. Then seasonal unemployment, again seen in the agriculture sector. If a person, if a farmer is sowing rabi crops, he or she will be unemployed in the other season, right? So, sometimes if a person is sowing seasonal crops, which only grows in a particular season of the year, and at the other season, the person remains unemployed. That kind of employment is known as seasonal employment. And if a person remains unemployed, that kind of unemployment is known as seasonal unemployment. Now, structural unemployment. What does structural unemployment mean? It is very, very important. And it is also existing in our country. See, whenever there is a mismatch, whenever there is a mismatch, between the skills which are required in a job versus the skill which a person is having when there is a mismatch between them and then the person remains unemployed. That kind of unemployment is known as structural unemployment. That is structurally, structurally there is problem in our economy. There is a mismatch between the skills required and the skills which are present in our people, that unemployment is your structural unemployment. There is one more type, that is your frictional unemployment. Now, frictional unemployment happens when a person is switching between two jobs. Now, for example, I'm working at some place, I, uh, I resign from that place, and then for one week or for one month, I'm looking for new opportunities. So for that one month where I remain unemployed, I will be called as frictionally unemployed. That kind of unemployment will be known as frictional unemployment. Now, there is cyclical unemployment as well. For example, during the times of recession, unemployment decreases. Many people lose their job, but that is cyclical. When economy is booming, then unemployment is lower. When economy is in recession, then unemployment is high. That kind of unemployment is known as cyclical unemployment which changes based on the cycle, right? <clears throat> but what are the major causes of unemployment in India? And why employment picture of our country is not that well? We need to understand that, right? So first is that we are having high rate of population. So 1.4 billion is the population of our country, but the resources which are there, right? And the supply of goods which are there, and the jobs which are there in our country, they are very, very limited. So because of that, unemployment gets created, <clears throat> lack of education and proper skill. Now, because of high poverty level of people in our country, because of that, there is poor educational scenario also in our country. And because of poor level of education, lack of education and lack of quality education, because of that, there is lack of skill development in our country. And because of this, again, it leads to unemployment. People are not able to get employed. Another reason is the jobless growth which are, we, we, are, we are having. That is, even though we are growing, even though GDP of our country is increasing, but the growth is jobless. Now, why this is the case? Because our growth is fueled by more of the service sector which is not able to absorb the extra people which are there from the primary sector and the secondary, that is the industrial sector, the tertiary, that is the service sector, is not able to absorb the people from those sectors. 
right? Because of that, there is jobless growth. Decline in small scale and cottage industries. That is also a self-explanatory point, which again shows why there is unemployment in our country. Lack of entrepreneurship attitude. Now, 90% or even more than that, students in our country right now are going up for the government jobs. They are looking for government jobs. Because of that, because of that, there is lack of entrepreneurship. Now, when whenever there is lack of entrepreneurship, the job creation in the economy will not be there. When job creation in the economy is, will not be there, the problem of unemployment will be persisting. And because of that, the employment picture of the whole country will be very, very bad. So lack of entrepreneurial attitude. Then agricultural stagnation. Now, agriculture employed the maximum number of people, more than 50%, 60% of the population dependent directly or indirectly on agriculture, right? So, because of stagnation of agriculture, reduction in the productivity of agriculture, because of that, unemployment issue still persists. Then, technology is also a reason. Because of the presence of artificial intelligence, presence of robotics, presence of computers, machines, because of that, the demand of labor has come down. So many scholars believe that because of high tech technologies and because of lower skill among the people in our country, the problem of unemployment is day by day increasing. Now, what are the various solutions and the measures which are taken by the government? Some very important measures. One is your MG Narega which provides rural household with 100 days employment in a year. Then PM Koshal Vikas Yojana for your skill development. Then Startup India, which promotes Indians to, uh, to like develop a startup, to start an enterprise. So Startup India is a program which our government has launched. Then National Education Policy of 2020, which aims to transform our education system in a way which provides skill to our children and which makes them employment providers, not employment seekers. Then Deen Dayal Anteyode Yojana, that is National Rural Livelihood Mission, that is also promoting employment opportunities. Then Mudra Yojana, which provides various loans to uh, people who want to start their enterprise, small sector enterprise. So Mudra Yojana is there. The National Skill Development Mission, again for our upskilling and skill development in the country. Now if we see the trend of unemployment in our country, we would able to see that from 2019 to 2020-23, it has been hovering around 7 to 8%. But then during the time of COVID, during the time of lockdown, it shot up even to the 25% mark, right? But overall, it has been close to your 7 to 8% mark, right? If you want to see age-wise classification from September, December of 2022, you can see it here, right? Now, this diagram basically shows us that Indian unemployment has been steady, but the youth of our country has been suffering. Because getting employment for youth and getting the desired employment for youth, it has, becoming, it has become increasingly difficult for them. So this issue gives a very bad picture and a very gloomy picture of the employment scenario in India, right? And we need to work we need to implement various government initiatives which have already been launched in a better manner so that this employment picture becomes, it becomes or it improves or it becomes good. Right. Now, moving on to the unpaid work done by women. It is related to your GS Paper 1, Rule of Women and Women Organization, which is a part of your social issues. Now, there is an editorial which says that women do seven hours of housework and men does under three hours, right? And this trend is consistent for women across income levels and caste groups, 
right? So in relation to that, we will try to understand the unpaid work or unpaid household work done by women in our country. See, first of all, you need to understand what is this unpaid work. See, mostly, if we see women who are domestically engaged in our country, that is who are housewives, they are engaged in the daily household work, which includes your cooking, which includes your cleaning, which includes taking care of elders, which includes taking care of children, which also includes taking care of all the household chores of the whole house, right? All these works which women of our country are engaged or women around the world are engaged in, that work is what you call as unpaid household work done by women. And in most of the cases, this work remains invisible in the overall economy. It remains undervalued and also it is unaccounted for if we talk in economic terms, right? But this unpaid household work done by women is very, very important. Why? Because it is the hidden engine of our economy. If women stop doing this unpaid household work, the overall economy will not be able to function. Because uh, according to the theory of Karl Marx as well, domestication of women is for the interest of the capitalists, right? So he says that domestication of women fuels capitalism in the entire world. So overall unpaid household work done by the women, it is unaccounted, it is invisible, it is undervalued, but yet it is the hidden engine of the economy, right? Many people do not account for it. Many people undervalue it, but still it is the hidden engine of the economy. But what is the need to recognize this work done by women? See, first of all, we need to recognize that the household work which is being done, it is not just the duty of women to do this household work. And therein comes the whole scenario of your gender equality. Now, since the start of this talk also, we are saying unpaid household work done by women, right? Which also gives a connotation that women are only, like women are only duty bound to do that household work. But this connotation is very, very wrong. What should be the case is that the household work needs to be shared among men and women. It should not only be the duty of women to take care of the household chores, to do the cleaning, to do the cooking, to take care of children, to take care of the elders, and to do all the many works which are required in a household. It should not alone be the duty of a woman. Men and women should equally divide the work among themselves. Which is why there is a need to recognize that this unpaid household work done by the women is against gender equality. And it reflects the existence of gender inequality in our society. Right? So, some more needs to recognize. First is linkage with the economy. That is, this unpaid household work, it is linked to the overall economy as well. It restricts opportunities of the women. Because women who are working also, they are made to leave their work after they get married because they need to do the household work. So it is restricting the opportunities of the women. So there is a need to recognize, first of all, this household work done by the women and then proper discourse, proper debate on it needs to happen that why women have to do the household work alone and why the burden of household work is on the women only and why it's such categorization is made in the society that men would be working outside earning and women would be doing the household chores. Of course, in this modern times, this connotation has changed. But still, majority of our population, if you see, it is following it, following the categorization in some way or the other dormantly. 
right so because of that there is a need to recognize it and then there is a need to have a public discourse on it and then there is a need to reflect on it and change the scenario i hope you understand it aids private and public sector as well the household work which is done by women it is ultimately aiding the private and public sector as well because of which it needs to be recognized now there was a debate that do we need to compensate women for the un unpaid work which they do but again this is also very very contentious see first of all if you are talking about the compensation of this unpaid work one thing is that then you are endorsing this wrong social norm you are endorsing that okay women have to do the unpaid work and then you are entitling them to some compensation so in a way you are reaffirming that social norm but what should be the way out the way out should be that unpaid household work which is done by the women in our society it is wrong first of all first reason is that why it is only done by women why more burden is on the women than as compared to men they both should uh, have the burden equally they should share the burden equally that is second thing after that we can talk about the compensation of unpaid work by any gender by men or by women right but again that compensation is also having various challenges first is implementational issue who will compensate them government would not be able to compensate everyone who is doing the household work then endorsement of the social norm we already discussed that it will be reaffirming if we just compensate women it will be reaffirming that social wrong which has been ongoing for years so we we need we need not support it rather we should condemn it that why the unpaid household work is only done by women then master servant relation see women or any gender gets compensated because of this unpaid household work a master servant relation gets created or a employer employee relation gets created because if you are getting a compensation for something that means the person who is compensating you or the organization that is compensating you it becomes your master it becomes your employer so in that case the household work which is done that would not be a duty then that would become a job that is also a challenge in this compensation of unpaid work so what should be the way forward right see first is we need to follow the three r's we need to recognize the unpaid household work which is done by women then we need to reduce the burden on women and have gender equality have gender parity and then we need to redistribute it that is it needs to be shared equally among men and women right i hope this is very clear to all of you and in this chart also if you see in this graph women carry out at least two and a half times more unpaid household and care work than men so this also shows you the same picture which we are talking about now coming to the fourth topic of today it is related to your space debris so isro's rocket debris was found in australia and now we will be discussing what is space debris what are the hazardous things which space debris can cause and what are the various initiatives taken internationally to reduce the incidence of space debris so for a gs paper gs paper 3 where space have been mentioned in our science and technology section the space debris topic becomes important so first of all we need to understand what is the space debris see whenever we send a satellite to the earth's orbit or in the space let's say that satellite is having a life span now once that life span is over the satellite keeps on revolving in the space but it gets redundant then it becomes unutilized and when it gets cracked into pieces and whenever those rockets those satellites anything any technologically related material which is there in the space it becomes unused it becomes redundant that space material which has gone from earth to space is what you call as space debris and you can also term it as 
स्पेस जंक दैट इज जंक ऑफ द टेक्नोलॉजिकल रिलेटेड मटीरियल विच इज देयर इन द स्पेस विच इज फ्लोटिंग इन द स्पेस राइट नो वॉट आर द वेरियस पोटेंशियल थ्रेट्स ऑफ द स्पेस डिप्रेस राइट फर्स्ट इज ऑपरेशनल सैटेलाइट डैमेज now we know that the space debris is also uh, floating in the space right it is revolving in the space it has the potential to damage the already operational satellites because sometimes if collision happens right the the satellites which are operational they might get damaged so that is one thing then limit orbital slots because the space debris it basically takes up a very high space or very huge space uh, in the earth's orbit when that huge space is taken by this debris it limits the orbital slots where we can send the new satellites so limitation of orbital slots is also a reason then life and environment threat let's say if that space debris comes to our uh, comes to the earth right it falls in the earth there can be potential damage to life also there can be environmental threat also for example if they go to the sea or a river they fall in a sea they fall in a river then marine life and pollution threat is also there then the threat of space junk that is creation of that space debris into a junk that is also one of the potential threat of this space debris that is the space material which is floating in the space which are the remains of your rockets which are the remains of your satellite or any technologically related uh, device which is spent on space which is sent on space by our world or by our earth what are the various initiatives to combat this effect of space debris first is your project netra which is launched by india it is a early warning system which detects the space debris in advance and takes remedial measures then there is space debris mitigation guidelines also of the inter agency space space debris coordination committee iadc plus there is nasa's debris elimination and reentry also reentry also then space debris removal system sdrs by roscosmos that is your russian space agency so all these initiatives are there to combat the space debris and space junk in our space or in our orbital Uh, orbital space so some very good points relate to space junk that is after more than 5 to uh, 5 to 50 launches 2300 objects are currently tracked in space uh, about 1200 operational satellites are there in the orbit now in order to like eliminate the debris we need to estimate how much debris is there so debris estimation data is also present then collisions between pieces of hardware add to the scattering of the small pieces that information is also mentioned that whenever two space debris objects or two hardware they uh, basically col uh, collide with each other then several small pieces develops right because of the breaking down and because of the breaking down of those hardware because of that collision then the uh, all these points basically gives you an idea that how space junk can be fatal for our overall spatial orbit and overall space exploration right so for our overall space exploration the space debris is very very fatal now coming to the last topic that is your akira ransomware now akira ransomware is going on in the computer systems of our country and the government has issued a warning against this so government has issued a serious warning urging the users and corporations to implement robust cyber security measures so we will be understanding what is the sakira ransomware why this is important again from our gs paper 3 science and tech purposes plus our internal security purposes where cyber security have been mentioned and role of media and social networking sites and intern internal security challenges have been mentioned so in relation to that also the sakira ransomware becomes important see first of all we need to understand what is this ransomware whenever a malicious software enters into a computer or enters into your computer then it targets or it steals 
the important data and then it encrypts the data and asks for some ransom from you. It demands some ransom from you, that is some money to decrypt that data. Then that particular kind of malicious software is known as ransomware. Where a demand of some money, where a demand of some ransom is made by the people who are attacking your computer in order to decrypt your data. Right. So Akira ransomware and it's working that we need to understand. First of all, it is targeting both Windows and Linux software. It steals and encrypts your data. That is very, very sensitive data of yours, which can be your banking passwords, which can be various like sensitive data, which a computer is holding. Right. Then it demands a ransom from you to decrypt that data. And if the demands are not met, that is, if you are not able to provide them ransom, then they will release your sensitive data in the dark web. From dark web, your data can be bought and sold by various agencies, by various individuals, right? Now, the two most common channels with which this ransomware can enter into your computer or can enter into your device, there are two most important channels for it. First is emails. And second is compromised websites. So emails serve as the most resourceful tool to deliver ransomware to your computer or to your device. Whenever a malicious emails come to your computer, you might click into that link or you might download that PDF or you might download that extension which is sent on that email. After that, that ransomware basically comes into your computer. Or if we enter compromised websites, we click various links on those compromised websites, then also the ransomware can enter into our devices. Now, protection against ransomware. How can we protect us against the ransomware? First of all, we need to have offline backups, not online, but offline backups of our sensitive data because backup of sensitive data should always be kept. Then regular update, we need to regularly update our operating system with the latest firewalls, right? Also a strong password policy for the organizations. The organizational policy passwords need to be very, very strong because mostly the sensitive data is pertaining to the organization only, right? So that is also one thing. Then multi-factor authentication. Normally, three-factor authentication needs to be there in order to access any kind of sensitive data of any organization or an individual. Then periodic security audits of the computer systems of an organization. That also needs to be there in order to protect the devices, protect the computers against the ransomware. So I hope you understood this concept of ransomware and what this Akira ransomware is all about. So I hope you learned something from this lecture. I hope you do your preparation well. All the very best and thank you for watching this lecture.